Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Rhino Live Q&A today. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm not sure where everyone is in the world, so if it's good morning, good afternoon, good evening, then it's lovely to have you with us today. So my name is Emma Pereira. I'm the Communications Manager at Save the Rhino. And today, as I said, we're focusing on Indonesia rhinos. So Javan and Sumatran rhino species that are both critically endangered. The reason that we're talking to you about Indonesia today is because we have our rhino COVID-19 crisis appeal ongoing at the moment. And we began that appeal in May. And the month of July, we are fundraising specifically for the rhino protection units that patrol through Indonesia's forests to protect rhinos and the other wildlife within them. So they do a great job and their work has been significantly challenged by COVID-19 as have many other places around the world. So this July we are fundraising for them. It's also great to be talking about Indonesia's rhinos because since 2003 Save the Rhino has supported Sumatran and Javan rhino conservation. So we partnered with the International Rhino Foundation in 2003, and since then we have been supporting a number of different projects. One of those being the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria Rhino Campaign in 2005 and 6, where we raised more than 92,000 or around 92,000 euros, I believe, for Sumatran rhino conservation and a fantastic achievement. Since that point, we've been continuing to work with our wonderful partners at the International Rhino Foundation, supporting projects like reforestation, habitat expansion and improving breeding success. A little bit of background on the two species. There are fewer than 80 remaining of each species, the Javan and Sumatran rhino, and we'll go into lots more about both of those in a second. So thank you again for joining us. Some housekeeping before I introduce our guests. If you do have any questions, we would love to hear them. So please do comment in the comment box below or just to the side of wherever you're watching this video. You may need to sign in to do that. So please do sign in when you're ready and have your questions ready to post to Inov and Kathy, our guests. Okay, we are ready to go ahead. So I'm gonna bring Inov onto the call with us. Inov is the Indonesia Programme Coordinator at the International Rhino Foundation. If we say IRF, that's who we're talking about. And he's been working there since 2006, but in rhino conservation more widely since 1999. So a long history of leading conservation for rhinos in Indonesia, doing an excellent job. So we've been working with Inov for a number of years, and he is passionate about Indonesia's rhinos. Inov, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank, thank you. So I'd love it if you could share with our audience in of just why you started your work with with rhinos and why you are so passionate about Javan and Sumatra rhinos. Well, yeah, this is long, long <laughs> history. That actually, there's a 1999. There's a, in 2000, early 2000. I I have a, a research about the competition about the Japan rhino and bunting in Ujungklo National Park. So this is it was the start. Of, to involve with the, the Javan rhino at the time. And then after there's a continuing about the, uh, there was a problem with with uh, the habitat, habitat of Javan rhino in, in, in Ujungkulon. Probably some of you are aware about the invasive species of the Aranga palm. So I was continuing to research about this one. And then slowly and after that, after that I involved with the Sumatran rhino conservation uh, from that uh, point until now, something like that one. <laughs> so probably we can we can have a lot of a question uh, let on about the, the Japan rhino. We definitely can. Um, and just as a little bit of background for anyone watching, Inov's just come back from Udonkulon National Park, and I believe he's soon heading to Way Canvas National Park. So within this this two week period, he has been close much closer to Java rhinos and Sumatran rhinos than probably most of us watching this stream. Um, and just behind him is a picture of a Javan rhino, which we'll come on to in a little bit of time. So we'll bring on our second guest today. It is Kathy Dean, our CEO at Save the Rhino International. Similarly, Kathy has been working in rhino conservation for a number of years. She's been our CEO for the last 19 years. So she is leading rhino conservation for us across all five species and first went to Indonesia to learn more about Sumatran and Java rhinos in 2007 when she met Inov. More recently, she joined him again in 2019 at Way Canvas National Park in Sumatra. Kathy, welcome. But, hi, Emma. Lovely to see you. Uh, it's, uh, maybe you can't tell, but I'm 
the only person in the office, everybody else is working remotely. So yes, we're all using Skype and Zoom in this new way of working, the new normal in of we're saying earlier. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and that also means to anyone watching that if Kathy does have to suddenly jump off screen, it might just be that the postman has arrived. So apologies if that does happen, we're hoping it doesn't. Um, Kathy, maybe you can also share why you got into rhino conservation and a little bit about your background. Gosh, uh, very briefly. So I studied history of art at university and my previous big job was fundraising for the creation of Tate Modern. And when that building opened in the year 2000, my husband and I went on a wildlife trip to Madagascar. And our guide was a lovely guy called Nick Garber, who has since become a very good friend. And he was so passionate about wildlife, about protected areas that one day uh, in a beautiful national park that had just been created i thought i would like to con i would like to use to do fundraising but i wanted to be for conservation and in those days he bought the guardian newspaper every monday morning to look for the con conservation or green jobs and one day there it was director save the rhino and yep i submitted my application and ever since i've been a rhino conservationist so i began knowing nothing but i've learned a fair bit during the last 19 years Definitely, definitely. And just on Sumatra and Java rhinos in particular, so you first went to Indonesia in 2007, and I believe you went to the Sumatran rhino sanctuary then. When you went back last year, we'll come on to the specifics of the animals maybe in a little while, but I think a lot had changed, hadn't it, when you next saw enough? <laughs> Absolutely. A whole new set of enclosures in this beautiful kind of virtually pristine uh, forest uh, and in two animals that had been born at the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary. So, uh, yeah, we met uh, Andaltu, born in, tw in 2012, and Delilah born in 2016 and I heard for myself Delilah's fabulous singing skills that were shown on the BBC say, the, the recent um, Seven Worlds One Planet series and I learned that her particular uh, care, the, the keepers looking after her, call her Adele because she has such a good voice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and if anyone does want to hear that, you can definitely find the videos online. Um, it is a wonderful sound, very unusual, but lovely to hear. Um, OK, let's get a little bit deeper into it then. So I believe we have a map to show everybody of Indonesia. And we're going to ask Inov to just talk us through really on a map and get that sort of geographic location of the places that we're talking about. Um, so that map should be coming up on your screens now. And then Inov, if you can just share a few of the key places for rhino conservation in Indonesia. Well, uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, actually, that uh, nowadays, probably all of you know that in Indonesia, we have more than 17,000 islands. And then uh, and some of them, that's a big island. And then Sumatran rhino, Sumatran rhino, this only 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 found in in Sumatra and only the three location of the of the national park in northern Sumatra in the Loser Gunung Loser National Park and then the southern Sumatra where you can see that in the in Lampung province there are two national parks that still uh, consist contain of the of the Sumatran rhino in Waikambas National Park in the east and then in the west in Bukit Barisan Selatan National Park. And then recently, probably 2016, uh, uh, the government of Indonesia and then and the partner uh, found the, the, the discovery, the, the subspecies of the Sumatran rhino in Kalimantan. And then nowadays, uh, there, there are there's one or two Sumatran rhino and one, one in the captive uh, breeding right now. So meanwhile, uh, for the Japan rhino, the, the one and only, the stronghold of the habitat of the Sumatran rhino, no, Japan rhino, only in the Ujung Kulon National Park, in the west corner of the Java Island. Actually, the Ujung Kulon, Ujung Kulon, this, this is, this is uh, Sundanese, Sundanese uh, language, but, but in English, we can call this uh, the west corner of the Java Island National Park. So the one and only, uh, population stronghold of the Japan rhino in that area. So the population of the, the uh, Japan rhino, this is uh, quite, quite promising that uh, from, from uh, 60, 65 last year, the, 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 the national party and the government of Indonesia announced that population is increasing the 72 individual. 
Yeah, that was fantastic news when it came out. I remember um, it was just excellent to know that there were a few new calves spotted on the camera traps. Um, while yeah, we're on yeah. Java rhinos, um, you were just saying earlier about your picture behind you. It's a Java rhino painting. Um, I'd love for you to share the story of that painting with everyone watching. Well, this is probably probably all of you are aware that that most of the, the picture, the first good picture of the Japan Rano, it was taken by Alain Compost. He was the professional phot photographer from, from French. And then he took this a picture this 1990 in Ujung Kulon at the time. So there's only two pictures. And then in 2004, I when I was in Ujung Kulon, I met, I met with, with uh, the local people that he has a patient about the, the, the painting. And then I asked him to, to make the, the picture. So this, this is uh, exactly almost the same like a uh, picture that uh, the Alan composed to the, the picture of the, the Japan Rhino at the time. So <laughs> this is quite an old uh, painting. This is it's a pre precious for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it would be precious for anyone, I think. Jarvan Rhino imagery is very <laughs> hard to find. Um, talking of which, we have a wonderful video that was captured recently, again from some camera trap footage in Ujong Kulon. Um, and we're going to share that with you now. Um, and then, if you can, enough, just share some points about Jarvan Rhinos. You said that their population yeah. has increased and things like that. But yeah, what, what's the species like and, and how are they doing? Yeah, this is probably if you showed now the the, uh, the video of the, the Japan rhino, this you can see the how the healthy of the, the, the rhino. You can see that that one, and then that that rhino on the the video and that in Wallowy, there's a male rhino, and this is a very very easy for us. This is easy for the people. To this, to the distinguish between male and female of Japan rhino. With, with, with the other uh, species of, of, of the rhino, probably from the camera trap, if you if you cannot see the gel for the Japan survey, male one with the horn, while with female one without the horn. This is only a small horn. That's exactly the 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 the, the, the male, the, the female one. So that the video that that probably a uh, few weeks ago it was uh, becoming viral here uh, in, in Indonesia. This is a male one. This is the name of uh, the name in, um, Mustafa. And at least the national park, the national, they have they have already identified around Ujung Kulon from the camera trap. This is a series of the camera that the National Park have been started since 2013. They have so, uh, so the progress and then why right now that, that, that the National Park can say that the population is increasing, this is from the camera trap. And then recently, the uh, together with all, all the partner, with the all donor, we support the uh, support, uh, support the national for camera trap. The yes. So I um I I hope everyone else caught that. It was yeah. A I see this. That's all, Emma. Can you hear me? <laughs> Hopefully you can still hear me. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. There we go. <laughs> yes. OK, we're back. Um, well, hopefully everyone else caught um, what Inib was saying, but um, the history of yeah, yeah, so rhino is. footage is that it, it's very hard to come by and often the people patrolling the forests rarely get to see them. So the camera trap video was really extraordinary to see. Um, I'm just going to head to Kathy now, actually, and get a bit of an introduction for Sumatran rhinos, as they're the other species that we're covering today. So we've got another video to show you um, to see the difference between the two species. Um, Kathy, if you can tell us a little bit about Sumatran rhinos. Sure. Well, they're the smallest of the five rhino species of a domestic cow, uh, something that we might know in Europe. And they had they they 
are noticeable for having quite a lot of hair, almost orangish uh, hair on their bodies, like elephants, actually, if you get up close. Um, they've got two very small horns, so in that sense they're uh, more like the, the black and the white rhinos with the two horns, whereas the Javan and the greater one-horned rhino or the Indian rhino just have the, just have the one horn. When I started at Save the Rhino uh, nearly 20 years ago, it was generally reckoned that there were about 300 Sumatran rhinos surviving it, uh, in Sumatra and on the island of Borneo, uh, both in the Malaysian bit at the top, Sabah, and also in Kalimantan in, in the southern section of, of Sabah, uh, of Borneo. And uh, for the next 12 years, I guess, uh, every time people talked about Sumatran rhinos, it was said, yeah, there are 300. Uh, there used to be some in Peninsula Malaysia as well. But then in uh, 2013, Inoff and I were both at a Sumatran Rhino Crisis Summit in, in Singapore. And that's really when the Malaysians and the Indonesians and all of the international stakeholders really got to grips with the numbers and said, look, we can't be talking about 300 anymore. There are probably... Oh, fewer than a hundred. And this was a real wake up call. And I'm afraid that since then, the last two uh, Sumatran rhinos that were surviving in Sabah in Malaysia have died. They were both in a captive facility run by the Borneo uh, Rainforest Alliance. Uh, they died of, of, of old age. Um, uh, one, uh, uh, one was having sort of uh, had a tumor on uh, on the reproductive system, which was sort of bleeding out for a long time. So, in fact, I think she had to be euthanized rather than dying of, of natural causes. But it's really quite um, uh, quite a wake up call, I guess, that we've seen one subspecies of Sumatran rhino die out during during our time in in Malaysia. Um, which means that the remaining rhinos are really precious and, and Save the Rhino with its lovely partner, the IRF, has focused on two main aspects, really. The Rhino Protection Unit program, which is the patrol teams of rangers going out into Wakambas National Park, into Bukit Barisan, Silatan National Park, I'm going to call that BBS in future, um, to go out to look for signs of rhinos. They document any footprints. Uh, Sumatran rhinos have a very distinctive habit of twisting the vegetation around their heads. As uh, I'm not sure enough whether that's for a scratch or a tickle or simply as a way of marking their territory for other rhinos to come and see, uh, to come and be aware that they're there. Um, uh, so the rhino protection units, obviously, they're also picking up snares. They might arrest people who are illegally logging in the forest. And then the other aspect that we support is the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary, which is uh, located within Wakambas National Park, and it currently has seven animals. As I said earlier, two calves have been born, and we are very much hoping that further calves will follow because with so few Sumatran rhinos remaining, the urgent thing is to get as many calves as possible, as quickly as possible. And uh, recently we've become um, a strategic partner of a project called the Sumatran Rhino Rescue Project, which uh, was developed about two years ago. Uh, the IRF is one of the Alliance partners along with Nat Geo, IUCN, um, uh, Global Wildlife Conservation, uh, Inov, help me out, is there anybody else who's an who's alliance partner? And we and a number of others have come in with, with yeah, grants. Yeah. About yeah. Of course, at the Indonesian government, yeah. Uh, and the a number of of, alliance, of strategic partners like us have come in, um, Wilhelma Zoo in Stuttgart, uh, Cincinnati Zoo, several other zoos. And I just want to say that their support is extraordinary because there are no Java or Sumatran rhinos held in captivity now anywhere in the world apart from in Indonesia. And for zoos in the USA, in Europe, in Australia, to fundraise for and provide veterinary support for Sumatran rhino, conser uh, Sumatran rhino conservation efforts is a real demonstration of their commitment to conservation in the field. It's not just about providing a visitor experience in their own countries. 
Um, this March and Rhino uh, rescue project involves sort of several main phases. It's to protect the environment, the habitats in which wild populations still live, so to secure the habitats. It's about event capturing isolated individuals and bringing them in a sanctuary, the one down in the south in Wake Canvas that we're involved and another one that is planned and being built in Gunungloisa up in the north of Sumatra with a third breeding centre in Kalimantan. So if you've got isolated individuals that aren't going to be able to meet other, other animals and mate and breed, the best thing is to bring them into the sanctuary. Uh, all the years of, of looking after the animals within the the Smart and Rhino Sanctuary, the SRS, means that we now have a much better understanding of their reproductive cycles, of their behaviour, of their nutritional requirements, of diseases that they might get. So we, we've gained in knowledge all the time, and I think it's really important to emphasise that Indonesian veterinarians have been working on uh, at the SRS. It's entirely Indonesian staff with external support from zoo vets, from Taronga, from Cincinnati and so on. But this program has been about building capacity within Indonesia to look after and manage their own wildlife. Um, at, it's, it's been great to see the progress during the last few years. I think there's an urgency now that's recognised. Um, doesn't come cheap. We're always looking for more money. But uh, yeah, so far, so good. Thank you, Kathy. That was an uh, incredible overview there. Um, and actually, let's let's stay with the um, Sumatran Rhino Rescue Project. And you mentioned breeding there and about boosting numbers of Sumatran Rhinos. Of course, we had Andar Andatu and Delilah born at the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary. Um, could you and and in of course, if you are if you are able to come back onto that call, you're a little bit blurry on my screen, but I'm sure you're still there. Um, if you could share just how that works. Is it through science and technology? Is it through natural breeding? What's the best way to boost those populations? Let's try Inov, he's the expert and he's been there. <laughs> Inov, are you there with us? Well, yes. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> you can hear me clearly? Hello, Emma? Okay. Okay, this is, uh, thank you, that that's true. Probably, uh, I just want to to highlight the, the, the quote from my my director this this morning. You think mobile, probably you, in everything that in the, in the, the kit box, we will try to use to save the, conser the Sumatran Rand of Conservation. So I believe that that uh, we will try to do the every every kind of uh, technology to to the, uh, the so so I believe with the uh, expert and the, and the, and the stakeholder would like to uh, to get the best what we want to concept of the uh, Sumatran rhino in the future. Well, but that's true. We will try to what we can do for the uh, for the for the rhino, Sumatran rhino conservation in the future. Thank yeah, you. that was an interview uh, an interview on Monga Bay, the the website that has had a long Is that running clear, strand. Emma. Yeah, I think we could get you at the end there. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, <laughs> For anybody who's interested in Smart and Rhinos, Monga Bay, which is an excellent website, has had a long-running series on uh, Asian rhinos in particular. Now. <laughs> Sorry, Emma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there we go. Yeah, yes, Kathy, you're right. There was a there was an excellent series on Smart and Rhinos um, just a few months back with Monga Bay, looking at the history, wasn't there, of the of breeding and and how those different groups came together to understand the true number of Smart and Rhinos left, and then work out strategies to boost populations in the future. Um, so definitely, anyone that's interested in some of that history, do take a look. There's a lot of detail there that um, would take up a whole hour of of anyone's time, I think. Um, Moving on to a slightly different topic, um, we talked about COVID-19 and, and also the Sumatran Rhino Project, a Sumatran Rhino Rescue Project, sorry, 
how has COVID-19 impacted that project? Of course, there are issues with health and safety of teams and like everywhere else in the world, I'm sure they're having to use new equipment to protect themselves like masks and hand sanitizer. Um, but has it been more substantial effect, uh, impacts on the long term issues that that project is trying to achieve? You know, if you're there, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, this is uh, this is the the COVID-19. I believe that the, the COVID-19 will give the impact from the whole activity. But fortunately, fortunately that that our team they are still doing the the, the regular activity like the RPU and the, also the stake, stakeholder. Uh, under the the Sumatran Rhino Rescue Project, so we have a step. We have a step that we have we have been uh, we have been agreed since uh, last year under the decree of the biodiversity, the Ministry of the Forestry. So all all the all the stakeholder nowadays working under. The decree they call the emergency action plan for the Sumatran rhino. So all stakeholders they they have piece of the the part that they they are uh, in, in Aceh. Our partner they call the Forum Conservation Loser uh, take a lead that uh, activity over there. They are doing the trajectory right now, and then after that they will try to move to set up the the pit trap for the capture and then in the one fight they also try to uh, prepare to, to complete the smart that we have been uh, established in SRS in Aceh soon as soon as possible and then in southern southern Sumatra there are our partner that the uh, Indonesia and then the organization that alert and also uh, do a uh, activity territory, and then after that they will the camera trap. Uh, they, they will set up the pit pit trap. Like uh, Katie mentioned earlier, the uh, the idea from the Smarten Rhino Rescue Project, we would like to uh, save the species by consolidate them, capture them, and, and then bring them to to the uh, facility of the Sumatran Rhino Century. So overall, overall the, the activity is still on the on the all the, the people working in town to do the trajectory and then some team also preparation of the capture activity right now. This is the the, the progress that I can inform to all of you. Thanks, Anil. Kathy, did you want to add anything else onto that? Well, d just about the the problems that the COVID uh, pandemic has has presented. Certainly, I know that um, uh, very there's a very experienced rhino veterinarian called Marcus Hoffmeyer, for example. He was supposed to be going to Indonesia a couple of times this year, I think, in off to to help work with the team there about developing the capture procedures. Yes, and it, Marcus has done many translocations from, from of rhinos, you know, for example, from South Africa to, to Botswana. I know that Sumatran rhinos have a very different, different physical animals, but he, to white rhinos are about only half the size, but he understands a lot about rhino behavior and about how to make the captures the least stressful as possible for uh, for the animals. I think uh, other impacts will have been the additional costs. Inov was talking just mm -hmm. before we went live about needing to buy visors for the rhino protection units and yeah, hand sanitizers, all the things that we have to think about here in the UK and Europe and USA. Um, I think the other uh, sort of uh, impact that occurs to me is, is the loss of international tourism because although tourists at the moment are not allowed to go into the Smart and Rhino Sanctuary for security reasons, there is a plan to, in future, to allow the oldest female, Bina, to put her nearest to the entrance so that um, 
pre-booked groups of small groups of visitors can go and see um, one of the Sumatran rhinos. Now, with the loss of international tourism, that that means that there are no park entrance fees being paid for Wake Canvas National Park or BBS or just as we know in Kenya and South Africa, that's hurting. Without the revenues for the for the for the government's national parks, that will surely have an impact on on how to pay salaries, on how to pay for the checkpoints for, you know, you want people out on patrol picking up snares. So, yeah, I think it's going to take a while to recover from the impacts of COVID-19, even when the disease itself has gone. Yeah, and I'm glad you touched on tourism, actually. We've had a few questions about that. And, you know, if ecotourism is a way to support Indonesian rhino conservation, obviously, with such small populations, it's it's not so easy as going to other places in the world where you can see rhinos on a on a normal day you know it, it's just not as simple as that so will will those plans enable a bit of funding to come through to the rhino conservation project can I answer first and then perhaps in off? I mean, so speaking as uh, I'm lucky enough to have been into the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary, um, but I would also, Indonesia is not, uh, the, it's it's challenging. You don't see the huge quantities of wildlife that you might say in the Amazon or in or in Africa, but there are, there are fantastic birds. I, I know uh, we went and had a drink at, there's a lovely lodge called Satwa Eco Elephant Lodge just by the gate to Wake Canvas National Park. It's got a lovely garden, very cold beers, mm -hmm. and it's good on its on its nighttime uh, mammals. Um, in of will uh, not do I mean slender loris, slow loris, um, but you see, you see yeah, Lori. Mm -hmm. you see unusual things. There's great birding. They've got some excellent bird guides there. Yes, Wake Campus National Park has elephants and and uh, Sumatran tigers and Sumatran rhinos, but I think you would have to be very lucky to see them. For, 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 for birders, really interesting place to go. And of course, you're not surrounded by crowds. You get, can feel like you've got the whole forest to yourself. I went in early October and it was dry and I didn't get a single leech in wet season, I have to say it's a different matter. But hey, we're intrepid. We enjoy all this stuff. <laughs> I think another really nice experience was the was the time I went to John Kulon National Park. We chartered a boat from uh, Labuan Baja, I think it's called in off, and we sailed overnight. No. Uh, past Anak Krakatoa, past the smoking volcano, and we moored off Handalum Island. And it's beautiful, lovely, warm sea for swimming in. And then we found sort of dugout canoes and we were paddling up the river, uh, up the Sigintur River, hoping to see Javan rhinos. We found a wallow, we found fresh dung. So again, it takes a bit of planning, but it's a completely different experience from an African safari. And, and I think, yeah, Try to do it once in your lives. It's an amazing place. Eno, did you want to share anything else about tourism? Yeah, this is. I I I bet the, that that Katie said that it's true that that the uh, the demand for for uh, for the tourists to see the Sumatran rhino in White Campus is quite high. Meanwhile, the uh, the Sumatran rhino sanctuary that we have right now, under the agreement that we have with the, the government of Indonesia, is the breeding center. So technically, technically, we we are not the, for the mass tourism or something like that. But it's true. Uh, Katie mentioned that uh, in the future, uh, the Yayasan Badak Indonesia they have already prepared uh, the exhibit uh, location that uh, they they would like to put uh, the the old rhino that we have uh, Bina, and then as the ambassador later on. And then uh, the Yes and Madak Indonesia with the national part is already now uh, discussed to make uh, what you call to build the good like uh, ecotourism, the ecotourism that can uh, accommodate the the demand from the people that who would like to to see the Sumatran rhino. But this is like like ecotourism. There's not much tourism. Maybe there's only allow uh, ten people per month, for example something like that, but still on discussion right now between the, our partner, Yayasan Badak Indonesia, with the, the government of Indonesia, because all the permit, all the, uh, all the you know, everything, this is uh, the decision from the government of Indonesia, because uh, from the, the, the regulation 
uh, the Rhino is a belong of the, the government of Indonesia. But at least International Rhino Foundation supported Yayasan Badak Indonesia. And now that together with the Toranga Zoo, we try to set up set up the like a good track or maintain or try to what you call the install the good exhibit location and SRS. Then I believe Kathy has uh, has visited the location that where is the location that we try. Hopefully soon next year that uh, the government Indonesia can uh, publish this one and then and all the uh, activity back to normal and then yeah we can we can see the the progress of the ecotourism later on in in Waikambas. Yeah, that would be amazing. I mean, obviously many people can't travel right now, but when uh, when people can, that would be a very special experience. Um, and if Bina knew she was an ambassador for the species, then, I mean, just how happy would she be? <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, let's go on to another another question. Um, we have one from David who asks, um, in of just when the last when the last time you saw a Javan rhino was, so you have that one behind you in the wonderful painting, um, but how often does anyone, and, and would you, see this species in the wild? Well, there's, there's, uh, do you know there's only 72 individual left right now? And then uh, I believe it's not too many people can see directly the, the the, the Japan rhino in, in the wild because we have a dead den forest and then they can camouflage uh, during the, uh, we are walking in the, the, the forest. The last time I visited the, 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 the rhino, the rhino in Ujungklon in October 2008, the three times at the time, I was accompanied the chair of the Asian Rhino Species Group, the Dr. Bibab Taluk there, and then we we uh, we were very happy at the time. We are very lucky that can see the the Japan rhino, and then well to see this is tricky. This is tricky. We have to know the uh, the good time to see the the Japan rhino. Mostly the the best time to see the the Japan rhino is during the dry season because uh, the the source of water will be gone on the, the forest and then more rhino, usually they will try to approach the river. So the chance to see the, the, the rhino in that location is, this is quite uh, high to, to see the, the, the rhino. But well, sometimes there's a, this is why lucky or not lucky. Sometimes there's a, I remember at the time, uh, some of the professional photographer, he has spent, uh, 15 days at a time and he could not uh, uh, see the, 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 the Japan rhino but in the, the, the same time uh, the tourists the, the, with the canoeing that only went out they can see the, 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 the rhino during the, the, the paddle of the canoeing of the Japan rhino at the time so well uh, this is the the luck, luck of the week. The, the German rain or not? Something like that one. So uh, to be honest, I started working with the the, the Japan uh, in Ujungkulon for the Japan rhino. So I I only seen the, the Japan rhino only three times. Wow. I mean, I guess that's the reality of having only 72 individuals left but um but with them all in one place people would expect them to be a bit easier to find i'm sure i'm it's sure it's just true. right place right time isn't it <laughs> well, <laughs> enough we'll remember but i think there are only about five people in the world who have seen all five rhino species is that correct enough yeah there's, uh, i'm quite lucky that i have seen the, the all the the white rhino in uh, in the wild uh japan rhino Sumatran rhino and then and then greater one horn rhino, black rhino, and then white white rhino. Yeah, just just a lack factor. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. And then I believe uh, there's still uh, still a lot of people, Katie. Like I can mention, like uh, I have a good mentor here, Mr. Widodo Ramono. Probably you you know that he has uh, working with the with the Indonesian rhino for more than 55 years. 55 years for the Japan rhino, and he. And then I learned a lot from, from, from here about this one. Yeah, this is still 
yeah this is a factor luck to to can, can see the 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 the, the, the Japan rhino but anyway but anyway that 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 uh, the concern and, and then the uh, attention from from the many people uh, especially from the uh, the international people to conserve this Japan this Matan rhino is very important right now this is a very crucial we don't want to let them uh, extinct and then our our uh, children our grandchildren all only see the the picture of the Japan rhino and then Sumatran rhino from the picture or or from the painting something like that one we still want to keep them alive for the future absolutely absolutely um and then if we talk about the conservation projects and for Java and rhinos they're they're all in one in one park in Ujong Kulon at the moment um we have a question from Jack that says how likely is it that a second rhino habitat will be established and and where might this be well well this is true probably all of you know that we we don't want to put all the egg in one basket something like that one right so uh the threat of the Japan rhino, even though this, uh, the population is increasing right now, but the threat still there. For example, like, uh, like the inbreeding depression, because the, the small population, the chance to, to have like an inbreeding depression must be there. And then, uh, and then the biggest threat as well about the Krakatoa. Probably you heard that, that uh, last year that it was tsunami in Ujung Kulon because the uh, the eruption and then landslide of the the Krakatoa and then at the time more than 500 people are uh, killed because the tsunami luckily the fortunately at the time the tsunami it was not uh, a damage or impact uh, significantly to to the uh, the Japan rhino no. because at the time all the Japan rhino uh, run to the south area and then the national park and then uh, RPU try to uh, identify all the location in the North Peninsula at the time. We, luckily, we didn't uh, find the, the the dead rhino at the time. But anyway, that, that I, I say that that's true. The, uh, we have to consider to have like a second habitat or the second population for the Japan rhino. And then it was written on the Indonesian rhino conservation strategy. And then our partner with the government try to uh, to uh, seek of the uh, the potential of the location for the for the habitat of the 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 Javan rhino. Uh, now they still on the uh, process, and actually we have already some location as the candidate of the of the uh, second habitat for the Javan rhino, but they still have many discussion uh, pro and con about this one and then uh, to find the, the good habitat in Java right now this is it's not easy probably you know the Java Island probably the 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 highest densities of people in the island and then the flat area this is quite difficult to find and then uh, most of the location that we have been surveyed that uh, have have a uh, this a good habitat or not but there's a back to your the question yes we have we have a uh, considered this one and then government of indonesia and with the stakeholder on processing to discuss with with one with this one and then hopefully soon as possible we have a uh, candidate the location and then we can um, try to go to the next step, how to uh, capture and select some good individual to bring them out of Ujungulon. Because we believe, like I said, that we don't want to put them in one basket. Absolutely. And of course, as you say, that finding a suitable location is just one part of the process and it's almost the start because then you have to choose the individuals, you have to try and move them across and have that secure area for them to go into. So it's it's definitely not a quick process, but, um, but thank you for that answer. That was really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned human populations, and, and Kathy, we have a question that I think actually relates to all rhino species, but specifically um, for Sajavan and Sumatran rhinos. John asked, 
in a world in which human populations are still growing, how can we create and find more safe, safe habitat for both Sumatran and Javan rhinos? Uh, it's a really big challenge, isn't it? And I think it's worth sort of commenting that, that, that thinking about Javan rhinos, that perhaps Ujong Kulon was not their original preferred habitat. They were we would have been spread much wider across the island of Java. Java is now the most densely populated island on the planet. And so the rhinos have been squeezed into that very westernmost corner. And I, I think just uh, and it going winding back a bit, one of the things that uh, the it, YSN Badak Indonesia and its partners have been doing over the last sort of ten years or so is trying to ex- increase the amount of food sources within the national park by clearing out the areng- the invasive orenga palm. If you can double the food, you don't necessarily need to double the space. I think there are certain areas in uh, Sumatra and Java that would be suitable for whether for either of the species, but there are competing uses. There's been discussion, for example, of a a park which is used as a military training base for the Indonesian army. And I don't think that uh, weapons practice at firing and and rhinos mix very well. Um, So, yeah. I think it will be a challenge, but then just last week we were reading the reports of human population projections and seeing steep declines in some countries by by twenty by the end of the century as uh, people make different choices about fertility and whether to have children. So I suspect that actually climate change will be the greater problem uh, to contend with in the next 50 years, rising sea levels, um, changes in the habitat. You know, if you get hotter, wetter summers, different levels of humidity, you get different types of plant growth. And I think, again, it's about managing invasive species within the existing national parks, making sure there's no encroachment so that we hang on to the protected areas that we've already got. And you have to do that hand in hand with the communities living on the periphery of the parks. You know, in Wade Campus National Park, there's this fantastic reforestation program, which is employing villagers to plant crops. There were some great pictures on the on Instagram just recently of families going out with their children to plant new saplings uh, at the start of the season, which will grow into trees, uh, r- replace forests that have been cut down through illegal logging. So some people are then employed to go and sustainably crop um, uh, uh, leaves and bushes and so on for food for the animals within the sanctuary. So I think these sort of job creation, reforestation, community engagement projects are all part of the picture. That's We've got to keep everybody on side. Absolutely. And as you say, climate change is, is something that's going to affect all species, not just these two, but specifically there have been forest fires recently and everything else. And, and who knows what other weather events could change before those future issues and situations. Um, we have one other question, um, which I think might help us to talk a little bit more about Sumatran rhinos and and when they might come back into the wild. So um, Dee in China has asked, um, well, she's actually said that when she lived in Peninsula Malaysia in 2002, she visited a Sumatran rhino sanctuary, very lucky. Um, And she asked, are there no longer any rhinos left in Peninsula Malaysia? Maybe Inov, you can um, talk about that and, uh, and then maybe share a bit more about what you hope for Sumatran rhinos in the future. Well, this true that uh, it was it was the uh, the program of the Sumatran Rhino Century and then Rhino Protection Unit. We had a good co- collaboration between Indonesian government and the Malaysian government. In the same time, at the time, in in Peninsula Malaysia, they also have the century. There's a more similar the century like we have in Indonesia. They call the Sungai Dusun in the peninsula. And then I believe at the time they have for. Uh, is calling with the five individual at the time, but in the same time, unfortunately, all uh, all died because of the uh, the uh, SE or like uh, something like a disease from the the fly at the time. So in the the same time, in the same day at the time, all the the Sumatran rhino in the cap of the sanctuary at the time killed because of the the disease. So this is true. This uh. I, if I'm not mistaken, this uh, below this 2010, probably in 2005 or 2006, and then it was the the 
the, the sanctuary in the peninsula. And since then, uh, the, the, the government of Malaysia tried to uh, survey the last, uh, hab the last potential for, uh, habitat in the Royal Belum National Park, if I'm not mistaken, at the time. And then we involved, we sent our RPU to that location to, to look uh, the, the possibility that the, the last Sumatran rhino in the peninsula. But unfortunately, at the time, there was no more Sumatran rhino in peninsula. And then after that, uh, the, the government of Malaysia declared that there is no more Sumatran rhino in the peninsula. And then uh, probably you know that the, the last population of the Sumatran rhino in Malaysia, it was in Sabah, in the, in the state of the, the Malaysia, in the Borneo at the time. And then uh, the government of Malaysia at the time tried to do uh, capture and then they can, uh, you know, save the tree of the Sumatran rhino at the time and then bring them, brought them to the sanctuary. But unfortunately, uh, three of them that's, uh, dead, uh, died because of the, the disease and then, and then also uh, all uh, situation. And then last year, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me, the, 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 uh, the government of Malaysia has been declared that there is no more uh, Sumatran rhino in Malaysia. So with the situation, we can say that the, the last stronghold, the last habitat for the Sumatran rhino, the one and only, only in Indonesia. So that location that only in the four location, like I have mentioned, three location in Sumatra and then one location in Kalimantan. Even though in the Kalimantan right now, there's a very few but we are lucky that we can discover again in Kalimantan, and hopefully they still have uh, more rhino surrounding the location. And hopefully that we still uh, capture, we can capture them, breed them, produce more baby, and then later on, eventually we can release them back to to the habitat. Something like that one. Absolutely, and um, I don't know if anyone watching has seen images of of the two uh, baby rhinos born at the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary. But if you have seen any photos of them under the age of one, um, they are absolutely gorgeous little things, aren't they? So <laughs> definitely go and have a look online at those. Um, just before we finish up, um, we've, been, we've been chatting for a while, but we'd love, I'd love to cover a little bit more about the rhino protection units. And we were saying earlier that it's really hard to see both these species in the wild. Of course, we have the ones at the Sumatra Rhino Sanctuary, which is slightly different. Um, just how do those units try and find rhinos? How do they monitor them? You know, what's their day-to-day -day like? Maybe we'll go to Inov first, and then Cathy, I'll, I'll ask you, because I know you spoke to quite Sure, a sure. I believe Cathy, Cathy has the experience as well with the, the rhino protection unit. <laughs> well, this this is the rhino protection unit. This, this It was established in 1994. For the Sumatran rhino at the time in the Kerinci Sublat, and then uh, in the 1998 we we built this uh, rhino protection unit as well in in Ujung Kulon for for the protection of Japan rhino. So this is very unique collaboration. This this a uh, unit. Uh, this is unit one unit consists four people consists four people and then head of unit from the ranger, the employee of the national park. This is government. Meanwhile, the, the member, the three more, the three more, the member of the, the, the one unit, this is from the local people that we select them, the best of the best people that, that we have to uh, many apply, application come to us to, to be the member of the, the Sumatran the, for the Rhino Protection Unit. So nowadays, nowadays in BBS, we have the 11 unit and in Waikambas, we have a nine unit right now. Meanwhile, in the Ujungkulon National Park, we have the five unit. And then recently, with the support from the uh, stakeholder and Save the Rhino as well, thank you for the Save the Rhino, we, we have the, the, the Marine Patrol Unit, the RPU Marine Patrol Unit, because uh, surrounding of the Ujungkulon or the ocean, then we, we have to put. So there's a good thing that this is a very active unit. They are working at least 15 days per month. So they are doing a patrol and survey. So this are in the, the, the unit, the unit will 
try to uh, they they try they use like a GPS and then also the camera. So whatever the uh, the evidence, the focus on of the, the rhino, they will try to to put on that the data, and then later on we'll uh, we'll put on the computer by using the smart patrol system, and then. And then not only the rhino, because rhino is the, the umbrella species. During the, the, the patrol, the rhino protection unit also uh, collect the data from like a Sumatran tiger in Sumatra, elephant tiger, sun bear, or ma many uh, uh, species at the time. But meanwhile, they, they still focus on to see the, 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 the Sumatran and Javan rhino. So for example, they try to uh, measure the footprint of the Sumatran rhino if they, they found it and then they try to put on the data and the GPS and later on we can explore and then we can put on the smart system and later on we can see from the, the map the distribution of the Sumatran rhino under the patrol. So back to, to the, uh, the, the, the rhino protection unit, they are very effective. I can say that to, to you the 15 days they are working by carry 25 kilogram or 50, 50 pounds per day. And then sometimes back home, they also carry carry a, like a plaster cast from the footprint of the, 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 the Sumatran rhino as well. And then they're quite uh, effective to destroy the, uh, the snare, the snare within the national park, because we believe the snare, this is more effective than, than the gun, because this effect, this is, you know, active 24 hours, 24 seven. So the, 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 the RPU, one of the tasks of that app, the RPU the, to collect and destroy the un, unactified of the snare the, within the, the national park. So at least this is, or can reduce the, the illegal activity of the, in, within the national park. Many cases that we can solve and then, but, this is not perfect. We cannot, we cannot hold all the, uh, the the cases. But at least, since the RPU established in Wai in Ujung Kulon, this 1998, there there was no rhino poaching anymore. So in Sumatra, since the RPU established, the last cases for the the rhino rhino poaching it was in 2006 in Waikambas, and until now there is no cases. Because we can, we can say that the RPU never found the uh, the evidence of the carcass or the skeleton of the of the Sumatran rhino. Thank you, Inov. and and Kathy. Um, we were talking earlier about masks and things, and obviously those four four person units are having to patrol fifteen months, fifteen days a month. Sorry. Um, how how difficult is that? Look, I'm I'm tough. I've done the Marathon des Sables, but taking my turn in rhino costume. I lost eight toenails during it. It was 53 degrees. But I tell you, I would not be a rhino protection unit uh, person for anything. When I visited last October, we saw just how much food and equipment they have to pack into their rucksacks. I tell you, I could barely stand up in it you know, with, the, with the rucksack on. It's so heavy. And the thought of having to wear a face mask over the top then you're attacked by insects and leeches. <laughs> this is a tough job and I really admire the people who do it. Yeah, I mean, as you say, they're not, not just coping with those things, but they're also on the lookout for snares and, and logging Ill illegal activity, working with law enforcement as well. So it, it's, yeah, an all round, extremely tough job. Um, final question for both of you then, we'll, we'll start with Inov. Um, I'd love to know what you think if, if people could just do one thing to support Javan and Sumatran rhinos, what would you ask them to do? Well, this is this is a very tough question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, I think that please support us. Please support us because we need the help from the many people. Because we, Indonesian government or Indonesian people, by ourselves, we cannot protect this, this, this is animal. We need to work together. We need to support from all the people around the globe to save this, this, uh, this uh, species. Remember that keep the Sumatran rhino alive, that we, we not only keep species 
but we keep the last genus. So I believe that this this is a very important that, uh, like I said that previously, that we don't want to let our children or our grandchildren just to see the the only the picture, not the live creature of the Javano Sumatran rhino. So what 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 we wanted to say that please support us, and then I believe. I believe the Save the Rhino International and International Rhino Foundation, together with the government of Indonesia and then many stakeholders, many NGO, we can side by side together to protect this species from the extinction. Thank you, Ino. Kathy, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I would say, oh, I'll try two things, Emma, see if I can get that past you. Obviously, for the rest of this month, all donations to our Rhino COVID-19 crisis appeal goes to the Rhino Protection Units in Indonesia. But also say you can't, you can't love what you don't know. So many people do not know that Sumatran and Javan rhinos even exist. And I think that's why the video that emerged last week of the Javan rhino wallowing, yeah, it went viral. It was on so many news websites. All my Google alerts last week were full of wallowing Javan rhinos. And little things like that, if that captures the public imagination, then they're curious. I would urge you to go to our website or to the IRF's website, find out a bit more. And uh, trust me, we'll be asking for your help. <laughs> exactly thank you very much both of you um, it's been a brilliant conversation and um, we really appreciate you being here thank you Emma thank you Inov thank you thank you thank you everyone <laughs> thank you so much everybody for joining us I hope you all enjoyed that chat with Inov and Kathy um, I certainly learned a lot I'm sure you all did too obviously there is lots more information out there online our website the International Rhino Foundation and just many more news stories as we've mentioned and videos so do have a look if you're interested in anything else to do with Javan and Sumatran rhinos or get in touch you know we're always we're always happy to hear from you we have another virtual event coming up very soon, so do stay tuned. It's World Rhino World Ranger Day even on the 31st of July, and we will be sharing a number of things with you online. So definitely sign up to see what we have that day. And otherwise, thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of your day wherever you are. teman-teman sedang melakukan cetakan tapak badak yang tadi kita temukan tulangnya tengkoraknya agak maju panjang ini kita temukan dua tapir ini <tuh>